And if you want a homogenous organization, then you'll probably hit a point of success and not go any further. And that to me seems to be the moment. And it's it, it's beyond sort of the, the business case. Like I also don't like that the business case for diversity or the mm. finding the qualified mm-hmm. individual, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. because all of those things are really to me buzzwords that says we need to make an exception or we need to do this because it feels good. It's good for business, period. And so while at the end of the day, for somebody who like me, who's very passionate about it, and I'm mm-hmm. very excited to see playing fields be somewhat leveled, while that's a nice thing, that's not the driver. The driver is it's a capitalist society. We want to make money and how you make money is compete in the best way possible. And to do that, you need a team that not only is diverse, but then has inclusion. Because if you sit people at the table and they have diverse backgrounds, opinions and experiences, but they don't feel comfortable sharing them, Mm -hmm. then you have Mm -hmm. lost the inclusion game. And why are you doing it in the first place? When I was thinking about questions for you, Sean, there's one thing about you that I have um, admired from afar as well as close up is that your ability and your gift, it's a gift. It's not just something learned. It's a gift that you're able to navigate different audiences so well. Um, I think that we all do it, but you do it in a way that you show up as a servant leader in whatever community that you're in. Okay. okay. So here's my first question for you. Um, as someone like you, who's deeply committed to inclusion, how has this helped to accelerate you to greater depths of position responsibility and trust with your advocacy for this cause? Okay. Yeah. And how did you reconcile any tensions between personal values and professional responsibilities and advocating Mm -hmm. for inclusion. You know, I do actually believe in the astrological signs and I think cancers are kind of chameleons. Um, And it's something that I've kind of um, perfected probably even from childhood because as a kid, I grew up in a neighborhood sort of, you know, economically, um, it was sort of, there was purity economically, Um, but there was definitely some racial diversity, although mostly black. So even though I am very, very tied to the Hamilton Park community. The community I grew up in was called Stoltz Road, which is like r- literally across the railroad tracks. Um, and so in that, oftentimes in my neighborhood um, and during weekend time, so to speak, everybody looked like me. But during the school day, most of the classes that I was in, once we got to school, it was like I went left, they went right. And there were very few people who looked like me in any of the classes that I took in any of the school experiences that I had other than sports. Um, And so I quickly had to learn code switching before that was a term. Um, But there's a bit of an inauthenticity to code switching sometimes because you're putting on a mask or a face or a personality for that particular circumstance. And so I think for me, what I did is I'm a a huge observer. Um, And, you know, being, being a lawyer, a lot of that training is about being a counselor, not just an attorney, but a counselor, which means you have to listen, you have to observe, and you have to take those clues. And I think the varied experiences that I had in growing up gave me the opportunity to observe, listen, and adjust. So those are good. But then at some point, I had to appreciate that authenticity piece. And that requires vulnerability. Um, Mm -hmm. And to your point and in your question about, you know, how do you do that in a way that doesn't compromise your advocacy, compromise who you are, but also still doesn't create a rift between Mm -hmm. individuals that may have different backgrounds, different beliefs, different experiences. And so I think because I created true, genuine relationships and friendships by listening and observing to people with people who honestly at the core, like we probably have the same shared values. We may not have the same religious beliefs. We may not have the same political beliefs. Mm-hmm. Um, but what drives us is the same thing at our core. Yes. And so that reaching into that and tapping into that commonality, I think was helpful. Um, I also think, you know, I was actually just talking to some friends about the, this co- notion of being othered and only. And I think that, you know, that definitely is coming among, um, you know, people of color or underrepresented groups. But if you don't really share that with, folks that are more in the majority, I don't think they have a full appreciation for that. So you have to have true, authentic relationships. You have to be vulnerable to share that. 
And then you have to trust. But trust comes from relationship. Um, one of the ways that I think that I've been able to do that is when I have broken that barrier down and sort of shared that we've been able to have really true, deep, meaningful conversations where I was able to reveal some things, they were able to reveal some things. And because we were coming from a space of commonality and we knew each other at our core, it made it more palatable to have some really tough discussions where we don't come away like one of us convincing the other of the other's belief, but there's still respect um, in that. Well, just to give you an example, I just had one of your uh, close friends and buddies on just last week. In fact, it was Friday, uh, called Janinder. Oh, yeah. And and of course, I told him that you were coming on this week. (laughs) And he stopped right immediately. And I I don't know if it was, you know, edited out of his interview or not, but uh, he opened his phone up and readily, he didn't have to find it, he readily (laughs) found pictures of yes. Evan and his son and he showed yeah. in the bathtub picture and all of that. And, you know, I was thinking, you know, I'd already been thinking about my theme for you. And, and it didn't surprise me that he did that because there is an example. You're just not speaking words. There's a commonality at the yeah. core yeah, in a relationship yeah. there where it's valued on both sides. And certainly he understands who you are through and through. You have not compromised anything of who you are. So now, I just thought that was just a real tie-in. That's as so, I was. What a special relationship. Yeah, that that's a good yes. one. That's a really good mm-hmm. one. Absolutely, absolutely. Let me ask you this. So in your journey from, I'm just going to, no, no, I want to make sure I did the, the second, second part. question. Yeah. How did you reconcile any tensions between personal oh, yeah. values and professional responsibilities in advocating for inclusion? So that goes in the workplace. But yeah. you know, even when I think about the fact that you are, the chairman of the board of trustees or president of the board of trustees for the Hockaday okay. school, right? Those yeah. are all different kinds of communities. Yeah. That community is probably different than your professional community yeah. versus another community that, that you have served with, um, with the village circle, with Texas yeah. women's foundation. So just again, you emerging as a leader in all these different rooms, right? Yeah. But how, okay. So go ahead. I think you, that that's where that observant and listening comes in because every organization has a playbook, has an audience, has a set of core values, has a mission, right? And so um, if I'm going to be involved, one, those things have to be aligned with my personal mission, core values. Um, But I think also you kind of can't come in ready to, you know, flip the table over. (laughs) So you do have to sort of see the ecosystem, understand how it runs, what drives it, what are the levers, what is good look like? And so when you think about inclusion, if you understand the core principles, if we are looking for individuals or people or partners who have these particular qualities, we want them to have high integrity. We want them to be um, highly educated. We want them to accept challenges. We want them to be able to have them. Everybody says they want to be able to have difficult conversations and courageous conversations in a constructive way. But if we want those things, then... If you strip away some of the, you know, um, I'll say the immutable characteristics that make us all different, not to take them away to make us homogenous, but you take them off the table as points of discussion. Because if we're talking about what does this individual stand for? Do they actually stand for the same things that we stand for? How do they enhance our mission? And then if you do that and you broaden the aperture, then you provide an environment that is more inclusive. Um, And then when you bring those individuals in, you highlight um, the reasons that they're brought in for their talents, for their um, abilities, for what they can offer the organization and for what the organization stands for and how that couples with them. And so I often try to have conversations on that level. But in order to do that, you have to know the organization. So you've got to have served. You have to have um, observed And you have to truly understand what the organization stands for, Um, because at that point, and this is probably where the the advocate and the, you know, former trial lawyer in me comes, you know, you take away the arguments of, well, you know, will they, those really sort of loose things that I really hate, soft skills, I hate that term, Um, Mm -hmm. fit, Mm -hmm. I hate that term. Those Mm -hmm. terms to me are Mm -hmm. used to Mm -hmm. exclude when individuals Mm -hmm. we think are different than us. And so- When we can lay the common ground and we can Mm -hmm. say, as an organization, these are the things that we cherish, that we prioritize, 
And let me demonstrate to you how partnership with this group, these individuals meet all those characteristics, characteristics plus, plus they may just offer a different perspective than some of the folks from the same zip code in the same schools and the same universities and the same Mm -hmm. congregations, church or temples or other places of worship. And so that's how you actually move the needle and change the game. But you got to start from that place of commonality. Absolutely. That's a good point. Yeah. And you know, the, another question that just came to me as you were speaking, for those who don't realize, or let's say those leaders that don't realize that they truly are not walking and operating in inclusion, give me an example or or just give me your wisdom on how you educate leaders on what inclusion means, what it looks like, and then how would you go about in developing that within a leader who really, yep. de- maybe they don't know, or maybe they do know that yeah. they're not be right. But either which way, how do you bring it to attention? How do you bring it to the forefront? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you're running an organization, I, I assume that you would have to do some other things to make sure um, the organization stays healthy and functional. But I, I was just, I was just curious about your thoughts about that. Yeah. I think, you know, so if you're, if you're dealing with a leader, um, there's probably a, a healthy dose of ego Um, definitely some education, be it traditional sort of school book education or education on the organization in terms of running it. They haven't ascended to that position of leadership, um, without knowledge, without support and without the demonstrated ability to effectuate change, whatever that looks like for the organization. So it's definitely the wrong approach to kind of come at them and be like, Hey, you're doing this wrong. This is what you need to do. So you can't really script it. Um, One of the things that I really like to do is ask questions Um, because people do love to talk and they love to explain themselves. And, you know, I might ask questions about, you know, have you ever thought about, you know, what your leadership team looks like and whether or not people Mm -hmm. truly offer different perspectives? What are the characteristics and qualities that you look for in those individuals? How are you finding them? You know, and so in my mind, because that on the flip, that could be said, Hey, you go to the same pool every time to look for people on your leadership team. Everybody on this leadership team went to the same three schools or lived in the same neighborhoods or their uncle knows somebody's father. Um, And then immediately individuals get on the defensive. And so I think asking those questions as a conversation piece will start to identify, wow, that's interesting. Have you ever thought about, you know, looking at some individuals that maybe maybe were from a different place, have a different perspective? You know, Mm -hmm. as we think about the pipeline of leadership in this organization, what are your plans as it relates to really making sure we can continue to compete? Um, And then one of the things that I always say is, you know, and I know, you know, DEIB can sometimes uh, have translated, particularly in certain states like Texas, to an ugly word and something that people want to jump away from. But and while I will say, even though organizations we are commercial entities. We exist to make a profit. It is a capitalist society. So I fully understand that. But what I also understand is that we are a competitive society. And the companies that do well are the companies that want to lead in each and every area in order to produce results. And so why is it okay for you to lead in profits, sales, revenues, and just be comfortable with being okay to lead yoker in DEIB? if that is actually going to advance the ball and and it is going to advance the ball for an organization Mm -hmm. because you actually are going to increase the profits, the revenues, Mm -hmm. the ability Mm -hmm. to compete, Mm -hmm. the talent pool that's out there, how you Mm -hmm. recruit, Mm -hmm. how you actually keep and retain your employees. All of that is going to be contingent on your ability to recruit an inclusive group and keep and retain individuals that come from all backgrounds. Um, And if you want a homogenous organization, then you'll probably hit a point of success and not go any further. And that to me seems to be the moment. And it's, it, it's beyond sort of the, the business case. Like I also don't like that the business case for diversity or the mm. finding the qualified mm-hmm. individual, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. because all of those things are really to me buzzwords that says we need to make an exception or we need to do this because it feels good. It's good for business, mm-hmm. period. And so while at the end of the day, for somebody who like me, who's very passionate about it, And I'm Mm -hmm. very excited to see playing fields be somewhat leveled. While that's a nice thing, that's not the driver. The driver is it's a capitalist society. We want to make money and how you make money is compete in the best way possible. And to do that, you need a team that not only is diverse, but then has inclusion. Because if you sit people at the table 
and they have diverse backgrounds, opinions, and experiences, but they don't feel comfortable sharing them, mm -hmm. then you have mm -hmm. lost the inclusion game. And why are you mm -hmm. doing it in the first place? So one mm -hmm. of the other things that I do, in addition to another question I ask is, have you ever sat in one of your leadership team meetings and tossed out the question and just let the conversation go? Because the other thing is that um, either individuals who are, you know, very familiar with that particular leader, maybe they've been on the team for a while or they do have some common experiences with them, will potentially take over the conversation um, or they will immediately adapt to whatever the leader claims to be important. And that becomes the charge. Um, and then the other question is, are there folks that don't speak in your meetings? Um, how do you pull them into the conversation and how do you make sure that you get the benefit um, mm -hmm. of this group that you've assembled uh, in order to help you win. Because um, at the end of the day, like every business person, every leader, even in the nonprofit space, they exist for a purpose. Even if they're not trying to make money, they're existing to fulfill their mission. So they want to win at that. So how do we get to a win? Is that we mm -hmm. actually leverage that inclusion that we've created in our teams intentionally and then have the organization benefit from it. You said a lot there, Sean. I'm going to follow up on one thing at a time. But, um, you know, the first thing that came to thought is I had a guest on maybe, I don't know, three months ago. Uh, his name's Ron Parker. And I always call mm -hmm. him one of the pioneers of DE&I. Yeah. Um, him and when you think of Ursula Burns and Kenneth Chenault and yep. just a few others, um, they, you know, Susan Chapman Hughes, all of them were pioneers back when it wasn't even right and so i had him on and uh and as you know he's been long retired and i just asked him i said i said ron what is the definition of diversity and he and he looked and he says it's innovation it's creativity he says because every company i don't care what industry you have to have the minds to innovate you can't innovate if you have a homogenous group sitting around the table there is no innovation there is no creativity right yep. and he said and he further said that the way they spoke about it, yes, it was a business decision, but it's beyond that. Like you just said, you can't survive. You can't be the best. You will hit a plateau of success and not go any further if you don't. Yeah, uh, that's great. Diversity. But then the one next step is inclusion. Once you have them at the table, how do you foster this atmosphere yeah. of everyone is seen and heard, right? Yeah. And, uh, and then, and that, uh, you know, decisions are made not based off of your own background, but understanding the diverse decisions or diverse, uh, you know, ideas that are coming across the table. So, um, I happened to ask Mr. Jan Janinder the same question and it was a very similar answer to yours. He said he did not like the fact of making it a business decision. He says, it's just the way it is and it should be. You get the yeah. best team of lawyers, you get the best ideas for tr for litigation. And, you know, he just went on and on. So, um, anyway. Very interesting. Yeah. My next, you know, my next question to you is, you know, let me dig a little deeper into, um, let's go dig deeper into compromising because I think that that'll tie in. You know, have you ever witnessed or been a part of decisions mm -hmm. um, in corporate or legal, right, world where success came at the expense oh, of compromising certain values? How did those experiences shape your approach to leadership and decision making? So what did you witness early on that you were like, absolutely, this approach affects the way that I will lead and decision make? I mean, now that you, um, you know, chief compliance officer, deputy counsel for, um, you know, Heidelberg now, I just, I'm, I'm curious of how that has transitioned through your journey. I have observed, I think it was, you know, it, I've observed that compromising, um, behavior on a couple of occasions. Um, and I think the one of the first times I recognized it or observed it was fairly early in my career. And, you know, what I'll say is that um, just as a backdrop, I think with experience and position comes the ability to exercise power in effectuating that change. Um, it can be very daunting when you're young in your career and you observe that uh, mm -hmm. because you oftentimes you're just trying to keep your job just to be frank, right? Um, and you, um, I do think, however, this next generation is a little bit different than us. They probably, they are not Gen X. You know, we were yeah. happy to have a seat at the table and um, probably not as bold. And I do admire this generation for that, but probably too. not as bold in calling it out and stepping right. away 
Yes. <laughs> we are, they also have a bit of economic comfort that we didn't have. Like I didn't have a house to go back to. <laughs> you know what? I think it was during my podcast with uh, Monica. She said the same thing. She said, you know what? She goes, I'm proud of them, but they do have a little more comfort that they know. That we're Absolutely. There. Okay. Yeah. And I, I needed my job. I needed to pay off those law school loans. I needed to pay my apartment rent. I was, exactly. I did not have a room available to roll back right. into. So <laughs> Exactly. And you, I mean, I have one in my house. I, you know, they are, they are a different breed. She's 22 and I'm like, she, yeah. I mean, okay. Yeah. She's like, this is the very way oh, it my is. Goodness. So anyway, so yeah. back to your question though. So the, the yeah. compromising, so I think the first time I observed that, um, mm -hmm. I was a young lawyer and um, there, you know, there are always these um, recruiting classes, so to speak. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, we want to have a diverse class and we want to, you know, gender and people of color and um, even different law schools. And mm -hmm. um, I happened to be um, in an inner conversation of a leadership team that was making decisions about individuals who would or would not be able to come and work with the law firm. And um, it was very disheartening for me uh, the way some of the. So first of all, you talk about Hamilton says being in the room where it happened, you know, and having a seat at the table and hearing that discussion. So what a privilege to be there to hear that discussion, because that those types of discussions shaped the way that we talked about earlier, how I seek to ask questions, seek to understand what the mission of the organization is and strip back all of the this person went to a historically black college and, you know, they're going to bring diversity and, you know, they're from this school and we don't recruit from there. How great would that be as opposed to the core uh, experiential pieces? And so um, I um, not that I need to be like lauded for credit, but I just was so frustrated by that, that, um, and the decision did not go the way that I felt it should have gone. And I probably doubled down a bit myself, but I just felt like this individual didn't get a fair shake. And I said, well, if we're not going to do this for this individual, we probably really need to reevaluate how, where we recruit and whether or not we should bring anybody, um, from these types of environments and backgrounds. And you could hear a pin drop in the room. Um, but you know, I, it went on so long and there were other people of color <clears throat> in the room more senior than I, um, mm -hmm. that said nothing and no judgment, but I, these are people that I respected and looked up to. And, um, I felt like fought for me probably. Um, and it was just disheartening. And I, that point brought me to a point where I was like, never again will I sit in a room if I have the opportunity to open my mouth to advocate, number one. But I also will go to Lisa and be like, hey, Lisa, you need to step up your game, right? I mean, let me let you know that this is what's expected and you're not cutting it. And so you need to understand that I'm going to be in this room ready to advocate, but you have to give me some tools and some actions to be able to leverage. And if you're not pulling your weight, you're not pulling your weight. Um, and so, you know, the, the legal profession, as you know, is um, not particularly diverse as you get to the more senior leadership ranks, whether that's in a, a corporate uh, structure or particularly law firms. Um, and for the folks that are, and it's getting better, um, but we keep saying it's getting better and it is getting better, but it's not where it needs to be. And if if we can't rely on everyone in the room, which we can't rely on everyone in the room, just being realistic. Uh, the polygenenders are, are rare breeds. Uh, there are many more of him, but they, they are not the, the majority. Um, and there's a lot of continued, particularly in this very toxic environment that we live in, in our country and even in the world where different is considered a threat. Um, and so you don't get a lot of folks advocating for um, folks that don't have their same backgrounds because they feel like it's a I, I lose you win type situation as opposed to we collectively rise. And so I would completely off your question. But when I see that compromising no, behavior, when I see individuals not willing to raise their voice, it causes me to question that core of like, are, where are you on the mission? Where are you mm -hmm. on the core values? Or is it mm -hmm. just only as long as it benefits you? You. Um, and so that's those are the things I sort of look and watch out for. And and it look, it sounds very Pollyanna. It sounds very altruistic. Um, and it's difficult to, I mean, look, I'm competitive. I want to win for myself. I want to achieve. Um, but I also don't need to achieve at the detriment of someone else. Uh, because what's for me is, is for me. 
And as long as I go get it and do my best, and it's not going to always, you know, tell my kids this, it's not going to always result in if you put the work in and this is the result you want, it's a linear line because it's not. Um, but I can feel comfortable with myself that I didn't keep my mouth closed when I should have opened it, that I didn't steer someone when they were not heading in the right track and help them at least understand. And they may not take that. They may not absorb it. They may not take it, which is fine. Um, but to me, that's helping to advance the ball in the right way. Um, but it, it's a two-way street, right? It's not all on these organizations because some people kind of come in with a chip or an expectation or, a, mm-hmm. um, you know, my grandfather, uh, I know I've, I've said this a lot, but it, it is something that I truly live by. It's, you know, you can't stand outside the institution and throw bricks at it. And so as much as you may be frustrated or um, upset or want to see change faster than it is progressing, if you're not on the inside, he would say, get inside and take a seat at the table and then understand the system and then dismantle it brick by brick. You can't do that from the outside, tossing bricks at it. Mm-hmm. You have to mm-hmm. be a part of the system. And it's not mm-hmm. pretty. It's painful sometimes. Um, mm-hmm. But you have to have that understanding in order to truly effectuate that change. Mm, so beautifully stated. Um, you know, I think about the fact that when you said it's brick by brick, and I think that is something that um, people who realize that systems need to be dismantled, that, that the people that are in the, in the inside are doing the best they can brick by brick. You can't do it all at one blow or it's not going to be a perceived win-win for all, right? Because you you still have to manage and balance all sides. Mm -hmm. Somebody's not holding up. (laughs) But if you do it brick by brick, you have time to educate. You have time to do it step by step. And pretty soon before you know it, you've made a change one step at a time. Yeah. Right. Um, You know, the, you know, another part of your answer is, you know, just even the answers you've given since we've been podcasting here is, you have, you've touched on several different kinds of leadership. Um, you know, that was, that was one huge topic, uh, even last season is, you know, when you think of servant leadership, collaboration, transformation, um, and I know there's others, but those are the three that I've really focused on and those guests that have been on and how they have maneuvered and used all three and understand the seasons yeah. of when to use them, right? Transformation being the most assertive, Right. Mm-hmm. your change coming in as a change agent. Yep. And so this leads to my next question. When you think about when you came into the Kimberly Clark organization um, versus you're going into Heidelberg, yeah. you know, what are some common threads and goals that you want to leave? What's some late, what is some legacy that you want to leave from Sean Brown, some footprints, some fingerprints yeah. that you want to um, leave? And what did you leave question. at Kimberly Clark? And, and what is it you want to do at Heidelberg? Yeah, well? that's, that's a really good question. So, you know, Kimberly Clark was the very first time that I was in an in-house legal role. Prior to that, I had been in law firms and having been a partner in a law firm um, from 2006 to 2019. So, um, you know, 13 years as a partner in a firm, you know, uh, a little bit over 20 years of practice. Wow. And it was very different because I am a collaborative leader by nature. Um, Mm -hmm. My nature is to go in, understand where everybody is, kind of find that common point and and help maybe even if I have a thought of where we should go, help have the team have ownership in that and shepherd that leadership forward. Um, That being said, when you're a partner in a law firm and your client calls you to solve a very difficult problem, you set the strategy, you develop the strategy and you dictate and communicate the strategy and then execute on it. when you go in house as a lawyer, you have this word that I came to fully appreciate stakeholder management. And so you have to understand who all the players are and where you have to get alignment in order to move forward. Um, and as a, a trial lawyer who's on the deadlines of the court and trying to reach a particular goal or result, that looks very different than a, you know, um, you know, multi billion dollar publicly traded organization who is serving a consumer and trying to advance change. Um, And so what I learned at Kimberly Clark was that alignment piece, number one, but I also learned that art of transformation um, Mm. because so good. what I was, my strength in being a collaborative leader had a Mm. weakness in not um, identifying for the team 
this is the plan. This is the goal. This is where we want to go. Because they actually needed to see that leadership from me to say, okay, this is how we get on board. This is how we help. This is how we carry it out. And I think I indexed at the very beginning when I joined the company a little heavily on, well, what, what does everybody want to do? How do we get this done? And, you know, let's, let's develop it together. And it's not one over the other, but it's, it's a balance. Um, mm-hmm. I think that my, um, something that I did bring and, and I developed going back to the authenticity discussion is that I wanted my team to have the ability to bring their full selves to work. And I truly mean that. I know people say that. That's another one of these phrases. And so I was intentional about um, when I was having a difficult day, when I thought a decision was tough, um, when I was feeling resource constrained, when I was having personal issues, when, you know, part of my time at Kimberly Clark was during the height of shelter in place during the COVID pandemic, when I was having trouble figuring out how my kids were going to get school done while I was getting work done. Um, just the humanness of it all, I think, was something that I wanted my team to bring because it it brought us closer together in a place and a space where we could not be together. But it also allowed us to take each other slack a little bit mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and accept, even though I'm the I'm to lead the charge that they're bought into it. And then they also realize where is my part? And, oh, she's usually typically strong on this, but today she's kind of not maybe hitting all our cylinders. So let me fill in where I can. Um, I think another piece that, and this is something I got from Jeff Malucci, who's still with Kimberly Clark. He's the person that hired me. He's now in a different role there. But Mm -hmm. one of the things that he talked to me about, and he was very focused on growth of individuals on his team um, and individuals in general, is that he looked for people who, were strong in places that he wasn't. And that was an unlock for me because, you know, as a type A lawyer with a pretty healthy Mm -hmm. ego, you know, I like to be the right person. (laughs) I like to be in charge. And if you, Mm -hmm. A, admit that you don't, you aren't really good at something and then go a step further and hire somebody who's really good at that on your team, you have to really be strong in the leadership that you provide in order to identify that weakness and then get somebody else who can fill that gap and not see that as a threat. And that kind of goes hand in hand with the DEI discussion that we were having too. I mean, it's like, Mm -hmm. I have to hire people that aren't just like me. So the other piece Mm -hmm. that I, you know, kind of took away from that was I too, you know, obviously I'm a woman and a woman of color, a black woman, and I'm over 50 now. Um, Mm -hmm. And I needed to hire some folks that weren't just comfortable for me too. Um, Mm -hmm. And so how did Mm -hmm. I make sure that that team, uh, that I practiced what I preached um, Mm -hmm. as well and didn't Mm -hmm. just go out because I know that there's challenges for women and people of color in the legal profession and just go look for that because I want to effectuate that change. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think in doing that, I think I demonstrated and that that's what I kind of like. I like to go into a place and demonstrate that ability to be authentic, that ability to lean into your weak spots. Um, Mm -hmm. And that allows the rest of the team to do that. And then you perform better together. The The other thing I would do is I think that my my community involvement has really given me some great perspective. And I always try to bring in to any team that I'm a part of, whether I'm a member of the team or I'm leading that team, mm-hmm. some of those tenants and share the benefit of that. Because at the end of the day, while I love being a lawyer and I've worked really hard at my profession, that's not who I am. And so mm. who I am is a person that has that training and those skills, but that's not what defines me. And so mm-hmm. I think that gives you some perspective when you're in those conversations, in those groups, and you're showing up and trying to represent. And I really want people to be who they are while we're achieving whatever goal that is set before us. Mm. Oh, very good, Sean. You know, um, going back to the thinking of them not as a threat, there was a terminology that, uh, and I don't know if you're familiar with it. I I really was not until one of the interviews, uh, Herman Bowles, I had on, and he said, pet to threat. Uh, At uh, one point, he was a pet when he was hired in. He was, and he was actually referring to the point of diversity, being hired as a diverse candidate, right? Yeah. But at one point, he surpassed the skill set of those who hired him in, and he became a threat, right? Yeah. And we were talking about- I did not oh, know the and, term, and, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you, actually, I want you to speak a little bit about 
the pet to threat term um, that you have experienced. But, you know, you were talking about what you, how you have developed in leadership, how you have grown. You're saying, I I need to hire someone that has a strength that maybe I do not have. And we are finding, you know, in our discussions that those are true functional leaders and and a point that's almost servant leadership because you're Mm -hmm. empowering someone and trusting someone to do something that possibly they can do better than the actual leader of the organization. So do you take it as, right? Do you take it as being a functional, good, healthy leader, building a healthy organization, or do you take it from an insecure standpoint of saying um, it's, it's a threat? And also those who you have mentored, you know, let's say they begin to surpass you. Mm-hmm. We, we celebrate that because we yeah. had something to do with that. That's the whole point of our existence. Absolutely. That we want those to do better. Like we want our own children to do better. Than Absolutely. Do, right. So anyway, um, but I, I do want you to, to share a little bit about, uh, you know, just your experiences from that, how you handled it. And of course, um, how you handle it as a leader right now, pet to threat. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, the stories. Um, <laughs> yes, I am very familiar. You know, it's, um, and that to me also kind of goes to the, you know, why do we want you on this team, right? And so when you focus on the reason I want you on this team is because of the skills that you have and what you bring. And even if you, once you get to that space of comfortability to say, hey, I have a void in this space and you're really strong here. So I think you can really help the team um, as opposed to, hey, we know you can do the job. We're really excited to have you. And, you know, we need, you know, the, all these things have been said to me. We need some strong women on the team. Um, you know, our our judges are increasingly more women and black women and people of color. And so we think that you could really, you know, be helpful because you know them and you'll be able to relate. Um, and, you know, one thing I did have to sometimes, and, and I say this to people who I mentor now, You know, there may be spaces that think that that's the reason that they want you, but you have to know your own value and your own worth. And what are you getting out of it? Um, And so um, I I think, you know, I think you talked to Julia at some point. And I remember having a conversation with her when I was considering some job transitions. And she said, uh, I was so excited because they wanted me and they wanted me for all these reasons. And I was just Mm -hmm. like, wow, yes, they really, really want me. And she was like, of course, they should want you. Now, what you have to figure out is why do you want them and what can mm. you gain from? Them? And it sounds so simple, yes. but that conversation I had with her now, probably over a decade ago, has flipped yes. my entire evaluation of any opportunity um, because, of course, they're going to be recruiting you heavily to get into the door. But yes. what can you gain from it? And so and there may still be sometimes when you maybe come in the door slightly as the pit. But if you understand and know that. But you're focused on what do you get out of that organization? How does it advance your skills? How do you further advance in your career? How do you Mm -hmm. use that platform to leverage your own success? Um, Mm -hmm. Then at least, because I think the disappointment comes when you are wrapped up in the pet notion and the characteristics of that, and then that no longer is enough, Um, as opposed to you understanding that's how you came in the door, but that's not what you have to offer or what you're seeking to gain. Um, yes. And so in my own experience, I definitely have had that. And then, you know, and it, it is painful, I think, when you because there's a lot of pomp and circumstance upon entry. And, um, you know, I, I've, I've had people say, you know, oh, we want to um, recruit someone, but we want them to oh, like only have this amount of business or this amount of skill. Like they almost want to limit the individuals that they bring in so that they continue to stay on top. And mm-hmm. that's the exact type of environment I do not want to be in. Um, and so when I realized that, and, and it, it it was lonely because uh, Harmon Bowles point about the threat, you know, all of a sudden mm-hmm. you don't get mm-hmm. the calls to collaborate on going to see the client. And, um, mm-hmm. and for me in particular, um, and it was so counterintuitive, but the more I was recognized and celebrated for my skills and for my abilities or for wins or for impact or action in the community, the larger mm-hmm. the threat piece rose. Um, and mm-hmm. it was like, oh, we can't take her because everybody knows her. You know, I, I actually really also don't like the, oh, everybody knows you. You have such a great network. First of all, I mean, I do and I've worked at it, but they're genuine relationships. But that's mm-hmm. not a that's not a compensable skill set. And so mm-hmm. when you mm-hmm. talk about like, I, this is another thing that I kind of talk about when I'm 
recruiting or 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 advocating or um, identifying talent in an organization. If you describe one person as, oh, um, she's a rock star, uh, she delivers, she really knows mm-hmm. her stuff, you know, mm-hmm. this is my go-to person. And then you describe somebody else as, oh, he's really connected. People really like him. Um, that's real nice. But mm-hmm. again, mm-hmm. these are capitalist commercial organizations built for profit. And so everybody liking you and you being nice does not translate to that. It's translate but to that. the star go-getter, it does translate. Just the words that we use. Yes. And so that threat space became for me the, oh, she's got all these awards and everybody's recognized her. Why mm-hmm. does she have all these awards? Like, let's talk about the skills. Let's talk about the actual right. um, core expertise, not the trophy on the wall. Um, mm-hmm. And and mm-hmm. oftentimes it was used to kind of minimize and maybe put you in your place. And so I just decided, um, you know, I, I no longer will be in spaces where I have to minimize myself. Um, and right. um, I have really uh, had the ability to choose that in my current job coming in and in my most recent job. But I learned it through a lot of scarred knees <laughs> and, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. you know, sharp elbows. Absolutely. I think also it was a way, um, I think you just said this, but a way to diminish your true gift, which is yep. the skill set. Because the only reason you got the awards is because you had a skill set that you use that they are recognizing through yep. the award. And so, um, yes, the words that we use, and you have to watch those that put those words on you. Yes. And, uh, make sure that they are corrected in some kind of way. Um, you know, words are powerful. Mm-hmm. And, and that could lead me into a a different hat right now. Yes. But, you, know, <laughs> you know, there's death and life in the power of the tongue. I'm just going to say that. Yeah. So even when people put words on you, yes, it's very important. I'm teaching, you know, that old saying that uh, sticks and stones don't break my bones, but words can, no, words are more powerful than the sticks and bones. Yes, they are. Because words is what transforms our future. That was gets, that gets into your psyche, right? It, it, it oh, completely. Because it, it starts with the mind. They're trying to get to the mind. With mind. And, yes. and, and I will tell you, there's definitely, you know, and I, I tell my kids this as I because I've started to try to sh- share that vulnerability. I think we need to have it mm-hmm. with individuals who we're seeking to influence and shape and, mm-hmm. and, and raise up and mentor. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I, I present this like just this strong facade and I, I do have it and I have mm-hmm. a great board mm-hmm. of directors. And but, yeah, those words cause you to, well, maybe I'm not that good. Well, maybe I just got a, that award because people like me. Huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's a reason that mm-hmm. somebody doesn't want to work with me or doesn't want to advance with me and it has to do with my mm-hmm. skill set as opposed to mm-hmm. their issue. Um, those mm-hmm. words can definitely mm-hmm. imprint and mm-hmm. you have to watch that and you have to guard against it. Absolutely. And, and another piece is I started out this podcast talking about, I mean, truly um, we're all born with God-given gifts and, and, uh, and you do have a gift, uh, Sean, and I've seen it at work and it's... Um, it's, it is an, it's, you know, I'm going to use the word, it's an anointing and it's something that's very precious and it's something people can learn from. But for you, I believe that it truly is, like you said, it, it, it came from the experiences of your childhood, yep. you know, going on both sides and that kind of thing. And God developed this gift into what it is today. Um, and then when you put the skills and the education behind it, that's why we receive the awards. That's why you've done all that you've done. Um, but you're right. They start with the mind. When I think of, you know, our children, um, if they know that something is innate, if they know something is God given, if they can still start in the mind and get you to doubt yourself, yeah, that is how they tried to beat and win. And that's yep. just sort of the human formula for generations, for centuries. If they can start in your mind, because they know they can't beat you because they weren't born with what you have. Right. right? Exactly. Yeah. So if they can start in your mind and start you doubting who you are. Yeah. In, in whatever you are tasked to do or to lead, mm-hmm. then they're hoping your body will follow. Yeah, because then you don't perform to your true potential. Yes. Because you start, you start taking on the characteristics, the words, the descriptor mm-hmm. that someone the descriptor. else has defined you. As. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That, that's, that's, that's good. Um, let me ask you, what would you tell your 20-year-old self? Well, Um, I would tell myself to slow down, (laughs) that it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and I probably still need to tell myself that, but I I have tried to be very much more intentional about time. Um, I think the, our, 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 
our children call it self-care. They're very good at that. Uh, yes. But for me, it would just be, you don't have to achieve mm-hmm. all the things all mm-hmm. at once right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And then I would say embrace those things in your background that made you who you are. I, th- mm-hmm. I think I spent a lot of time in my 20s. You know, we talked about just like childhood and growing up, but even just personal circumstances, which were, you know, I didn't grow up destitute or in, you know, the most horrific of situations, but there was some very tough personal family dynamics and I compartmentalized. And that, I think when you talk about the gift, I think it's the gift of compartmentalization because I can focus on a task that I need to focus on and be all in on that. Because that were those those are the skills that I've developed as a kid from like survival, um, and the education was the polish of that focus in getting me into the right place. Because I very much could have turned a different way, mm-hmm. and so I would mm-hmm. tell myself, lean into that. Um, mm-hmm. Because I, I remember many days when I was a young associate at the law firm, and you know I had this dual existence of. You know, the ivory tower office on the 24th high rise floor, Mm -hmm. um, going to lunch and all these fine dining and working with Mm -hmm. these clients with more money than I ever could imagine and more zeros that I never, ever thought I would count in terms of the businesses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then having sort of the go back home or go back on. And it it was just a very different experience. And it was not like my peers. And so, you know, I would not talk about my background my experience again I think it takes trust and you know with certain people I ultimately got that but I would tell myself that is actually that to me is the superpower because those Mm -hmm. experiences while they weren't Mm -hmm. the most pleasant they are Mm -hmm. what I leverage in order to have empathy in order to seek understanding in order to seek commonality and they keep me grounded because Mm -hmm. you can very much read your own press and believe your own hype but those are the things that I hang on to because that's that's who I am. Mm-hmm. And and mm-hmm. that kind of goes back to like where we started and like th- this is me. And mm-hmm. maybe it's also at this point, you know, with so many notches on the belt and years past, I, I have a, you know, I have a great group of friends. I have a great mm-hmm. area of support. I feel like I've done what has been expected um, in the career. And so now this is me. And love it or leave it. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. I rem- I always remember all our little conversations because we tend to go deep very quickly. We don't talk often, but right. we do. It's it's of substance, right? Yes. And I remember you saying you took time to visit with, was it an aunt? It was something you did and you were very moved by it. It was a relative. You had taken your child to go to a summer camp or something. Oh, yes. Yes. And you... And I remember it hit me very, the fact that I'm just remembering this little piece, yeah. I mean, we probably talked about it only for about 20 seconds, Yeah. but I thought to myself, I am I could have given the same answer when I would tell my 20 year old self, it's embracing those things, embracing the the past almost, not in a, not going back in the past, not going backwards, right. but embracing right. who you are, who you truly are, where you come from. And Cause it, it is, it's, a, it's, it, to me, that's a superpower as okay. you know. Um, and, uh, but I remember you talking about that and just what yeah. you got out of Yeah. It. My aunt in Ohio that she's 90. Your aunt in Ohio. 90. That was it. Yes. Uh-huh. 90 what again? 90. I think she's 93 now. Mm-hmm. 93. Yeah. Yeah. I, I often look at Lauren, uh, Lauren, my daughter, 22, and she'll tell me, mom, I'm not like you. I'm not going to just go back to back to back to back. Yeah. And I, there is something about that generation going back to the fact they are a little more comfortable, but, um, I, I think that that is very important. I would tell my 20 year old self the same thing. Yeah. Slow down. I, look, I, because here's the deal. Like I'm also trying to not to dismantle that mindset, particularly mm-hmm. for black women. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I think, you know, what was drilled into me, it was like, you can do it all. You just, you know, you put all the problems of the world on your back and we just keep going. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that's what I observed. I mean, and, and, you got this like, you know, extreme trophy and cheer for being a strong black woman. And everybody was so proud of you. And that's a lot to carry. It is not sustainable. And um, I am intentionally seeking to dismantle that type of behavior 
for my mm -hmm. girls, for all my kids, mm -hmm. but particularly for my girls, um, yes. because I don't want them. I don't want them to look back. I'm sure they're going to look back and tell themselves something at their, but I don't want them mm -hmm. to look back and feel like they needed to also model that, you know, and we grew up also in the mm -hmm. time when it was, you know, the I am woman, hear me roar. So we had the gender piece uh -huh. going and you can have it all. Um, and then, you know, we looked at, for me, you know, our mothers, our grandmothers, our aunts who, you know, were the most educated in their families, uh, but also ran the household and supported the whole family. It was just a lot. And so we just sort of were like, this is how it should be. Um, and we just picked that up and kept it going. Um, and that doesn't make for longevity of health, mental health in particular, but also physical health. Mm -hmm. um, and so I want to demonstrate differently for the girls. Mm -hmm. So good. I want to do the same uh, for Lauren. So yeah, absolutely. And here's my last question. What books are you reading besides the Bible? Uh -huh. What books are you reading and why? Really good question. And so true confession, I'm not a reader. Um, and, um, but because I read so much for work, that being said, I also usually don't have time. So when I am reading, it's usually vacation. And as you know, right now I'm on a, a mini break. Um, as I departed Kimberly Clark in July, I'm going to start with Heidelberg materials in actually this month, next week. Um, uh, but yeah, next week, yep. but a friend, Julia, Julia Simon actually gave me this book and she yes. and I were just talking about it last yes. night called Multipliers. And okay. I am devouring this book. Um, Almost as if I were in school. Um, and it's talking about leadership styles. And so it very much okay. goes to kind of what we've been discussing. I don't know if you've read it or not, but. No, who's this, it? By? Uh, who's the author? Um, I have to go back and look at the name. It's a woman. I'll, I'll give it to you in a second. But, okay, okay, okay. Give it to um, but so, you know, multipliers, it's a style of leadership. And there's multipliers mm -hmm. and there's diminishers. And mm -hmm. each chapter kind of concludes with a um, almost a summary kind of in a chart form, which very much speaks to me. I love a chart. Um, yeah. but with key takeaways and it talks about how you empower teams to grow and perform beyond their individual collective best. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you really trust individuals to, mm -hmm. um, as a multiplier, you come into it with a mindset of mm -hmm. my team is smart. I trust them to do their job. They understand the goal and this is how we do it together. And I'm going to empower them to do that. Diminishers mm -hmm. think I'm the smartest person in the room. They won't be able to get it done unless mm -hmm. I tell them how to do it, when to do it, where to do it. And then I need to monitor them every step of the way. Mm -hmm. What you do in that diminisher type capacity is you take away the benefit of true unlock of performance of your team. And they perform mm -hmm. down to exactly where you want them to be. Whereas if you multiplied, they could perform beyond what you even initially imagined. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's my that I would like to be that type of leader and I'm nurturing that. It's, I'm really loving that book. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other book that I haven't started, but is on my nightstand is Atomic Habits, uh, which was also I have about that and I haven't one. read it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I have still not read that one. Okay. But that mm -hmm. I'd actually have a, I'm decided I need to be better about my reading. And I think the space that I'm going to lean into is this leadership space because, you know, mm -hmm. to your question previously about impact, Mm -hmm. I do want to be impactful that, you know, I choose a word of the year every year. This year, my, th this year, my word is joy. But um, the year mm -hmm. I started the village giving circle, my year, my word was impact. And mm -hmm. how do I walk into a space and leave it better than when I left it? And mm -hmm. I think that really strong leaders um, take tidbits from observing, but also they gain knowledge and um, gaining that knowledge means identifying different authors, techniques, types, um, mindsets that you can employ to not only challenge and better yourself, but also to better your team. And so mm -hmm. I'm committed to to reading more. Um, but the 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 book that Julia gave me has definitely been a jump start for that. Well, I'm going to pick that one up. I like the title alone. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, I'll I'll end the podcast here. I've enjoyed this. I knew I would. Um, I knew it'd be uh, something that filled my cup for the day. Now you have me all pumped. I'm ready. That's good. You know? Thank you for okay. having me. No, this is this is good. It gets yeah. my juices flowing. You know, I'm. Okay, I okay, love I'll what see. you're doing. I can't wait to listen. All right. I know exactly. Me too. Me too. Okay. All Bye -bye. right. Okay.